to welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, we'd like to ask uh, Mary to be with us, the Blessed Mother. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. And Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. We say in the Hail Holy Queen, it's a beautiful prayer composed by Herman the Cripple. Yes. <laughs> She's our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's start by praying to Hail Mary. Yes. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We'd never be so bold as to start our class without asking our spiritual director to be with us. The spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. A lot of beautiful name for him. <clears throat> He's the counselor, he's the consoler, he's also the mutual bond of love between the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. He is also the paraclete, and the Holy Spirit is the finger of God. And St. Paul says in Romans 8, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans. Yes. So that we can say, Abba. Abba. So as we start off this week, let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect and to set our hearts on fire with the love of God. We can sing the classical hymn to the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made, to fill the hearts which thou hast made. O Comforter, to thee we cry, Thou heavenly gift from God most high, Thou fount of life and fire of love, The soul's anointing from above, The soul's anointing from above. Praise be to Thee, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, three in one. And may the Son on us bestow the gifts that from the Spirit flow. The gifts that from the Spirit flow. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray, pray for, for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Lanteri, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Nisha Leola, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. So we're going to be uh, starting off our Perseverance class. I've been somewhat remiss over the past couple of weeks on talking about the Catechism, so. So maybe if you give us a summary of the Catechism over the past few days, Father, is that a good idea? Yes, yes, you're reading my mind, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or reading my notes, right? <laughs> yes, Father. <laughs> yes, on a personal note, um, someone today who has your name is celebrating her birthday. My sister, Mary Therese. Oh, my goodness. It's her birthday day, and uh, she's a year older than last year. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it usually happens, unless it's my birthday, because I celebrate every four years leap year, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. So maybe say a prayer for her. Yes, absolutely. And Mary Therese and her yes. eight children. She's been in our forum with her husband more than once. Yes, right? yes, she has. So we'll pray for her. Yes. Actually, the Mass at 8 o'clock is going to be offered for her, so that's a, a great blessing. Yeah. Yes, that is. All right, uh, you asked me um, if I would give a brief o overview of the Catechism. Over the past couple of weeks, just hold this up for our people. 
this is what we've been working on. Okay, we've been working on the Bible. He's been explaining the Bible. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of that because uh, the essence of our perseverance reflection is the Bible, right? Yes. So we've got the first reading, the psalm, the, then we've got the gospel reading. And then Sunday we actually have three readings. So this is going to be a, a flash summary of, of the Bible and to help us to appreciate it more and understand it uh, more and more each day. Uh, Bible, the word from Greek is biblion. And you know what it means? It, it, means, it means books. That's the, the Greek. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a, a word picture to understand the Bible better. The Bible, it's, it means books. Okay, try to imagine uh, maybe when you were 10 years old, before we had the internet. And your, your mother took you to the library, okay? Or maybe you went to the school library. You saw these shelves of, of books. And you looked up, oh God, there's biology. There's chemistry. There's grammar. There's fiction. There's nonfiction. There's poetry, there's astronomy, there's meteorology, there's plants, there's animals, and I can go on and on. In other words, the different literary genre that you find there, in a certain sense, that image, word picture I've given to you is 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 good um, word picture of the Bible. That is a good word yeah. picture. Yes. Yeah. Because we've got, the Bible is a series of books, and it has actually 73 books. So there are 46 books in the Old Testament, and there are 27 books in the New Testament. Now each book is, each book is, is, is different. Okay, who's the author of the Bible is God. Yes. Uh, that's a good author, right? Yes, good author. <laughs> okay. But God, God uses human persons to write it. Okay, it's called, in, um, in uh, the words of Aristotle, the secondary cause, okay? Yes. Or the instrumental cause. Or Mother Teresa says, uh, I'm the pencil and God writes with me, okay? Yes. So every one of these books is inspired by God. And there's a concept called inerrancy. Yes. Inerrancy means you don't have any errors in it. If there is an error, it's because the human person interpreting it is interpreting it wrong. But you really can't say that the, the Bible has errors in it. Because we make mistakes, don't we? God doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we make mistakes every day. Yes. God uh, is flawless. Yes. Okay, so I think that's important that it's an inerrancy, which the Catechism speaks about. It also speaks about inspiration, that these hu human instruments were inspired to write down the Word of God. So those two concepts, inerrancy and inspiration, are key in understanding the Bible. And see the Bible as if it were a, a library of books. Now, if you uh, go, you uh, maybe when maybe. The, well, the first time you went and you saw those books, maybe you were 10 years old, you saw there was a book on, on astrophysics. And when you were 10, you didn't care too much, did you? No. There was a book on, uh, on flowers and animals. No? Oh, that's more interesting, right? <laughs> so you didn't tell your mom, take that book out on astrophysics. I want to read that before I go to bed. No. Well, maybe on animals. Mm -hmm. animals in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably even right now, all of you have maybe have a favorite book in the Bible. Right? Yes. And it's not, and not to say that you're, um, you're, uh, you're not liking the other books. It's just we have certain preferences at certain times. 
in our Ignatian form, what we do at times is we will say, what are your favorite three verses right now? And when, as Cardinal Newman said, we're always going through change. Yes. Okay? The following week, there might be another, another verse that, uh, that really piques your interest. Yes. Okay, so um, let's go through, uh, the, okay, the, the Bible is the Word of God, but there are different literary forms that are used. For example, um, uh, a, a poem is not prose, okay? Fiction is not nonfiction, okay? A, a, a parable of Jesus is not the same as a miracle. A preaching of Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount is very different than Jesus raising the girl from the dead. Yes. Uh, in literature, this is called literary genre, yes. okay? literary forms. And this is important to understand the Bible, because a parable is not a miracle. That's right. Uh, Jesus preached parables and he did miracles, but they're two different, they're two different events. Okay, and um, then styles. Let me give you a, uh, uh, an example from American classical literature, with your permission. Okay? Yes. Okay, when I studied at college years ago, uh, among the greatest writers in American literature was Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, John Steinbeck, Okay. Yes. Those were among the great, the greatest American writers. Now, yes. if we go to England, it's going to be Milton and Byron and Shakespeare and Chaucer. Uh, but if you've ever read the writings of uh, of Hemingway and you compare it to, to Faulkner, very different. Yes. Because Hemingway used to be, he used to be a uh, a journalist in Kansas City. So a journalistic style is the sentences are short and succinct. I was once doing a short study of Hemingway a couple of months ago, and he said the first sentence in, in um, an article should be just a few words, mm -hmm. and the first paragraph should be short. Mm -hmm. You should have a catchy title, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some principles of journalism. Okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> Giving a free yes. journalism course today. Yes, huh? yes. <laughs> Whereas Faulkner uses a lot of adjectives and a lot of descriptions and long sentences and instead of a simple sentence, a compound sentence, okay? Yes. So uh, all these elements on a human level help us understand the Bible. Okay, so there's our a little, a little English lesson for the day, okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> so let's divide the Bible, let's divide the Bible, the, the, the library in the different categories. Uh, and many of you, maybe you've heard this before, but I think it's a good refresher course, don't you think? Yes, oh so yes. And you easily forget the basics. Right. So the Bible, it means uh, uh, books. The author is God. God's the author, the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. That would be the most generic def uh, division. Right. Old Testament and New Testament. Now the Old Testament has 46 books and you can divide the Old Testament into four or five different blocks of um, information. Okay, the first would be, it's called the Pentateuch. Now Penta, that means five. Pentateuch. And that'd be Genesis, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of the Bible. And according to tradition, that's attributed to Moses. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to know that. Attributed to Moses, those first five books. Now, if you speak to a Jew in ecumenical dialogue, okay, they would call it, not the Pentateuch, they would call it the Torah. So they called the Torah, we called it the Pentateuch. No? So the next time you have an ecumenical dialogue with your Jewish neighbor, you make, just make sure you, you know the vocabulary, okay? <laughs> Those are the first five books of the Bible. Then you have uh, what are called the historical books. 
and I mentioned a few. Uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, Chronicles. What is the origin of this? Well, the Jewish people were surrounded by people, nations, that had kings. But in God's divine plan, God always wanted them not to have a king. You know why? Because he wanted to be their king. Called a theocracy. Mm -hmm. okay? Not a monarchy, but a theocracy. Yes. Not a democracy, but a theocracy. <laughs> theocracy, okay? Yes. That's what God wanted. But hard headed as they were, they said, No, we want a king. And there's a passage in the Bible where God says, Okay, if you're if you're going to have a king, you're going to have a lot of problems. You're going to have wars. You're going to have mutinies. You're going to have a lot of bloodshed. You're going to have a lot of division. There's going to be a lot of hatred. There's going to be a lot of anger. You're going to be taken as slaves to another nation. This is all going to happen. You hear that? Yes. And they said, we want a king anyway. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? That is incredible. Yeah. If I were to outline, <clears throat> you know, like, like your daughter, you know, this guy, this guy, you, you want to marry him? He's, he, he's, just, he's got tattoos from the top of his head to his toe. Uh, he's 30 years old. He's only graduated from second grade. He's never worked. <laughs> He's not a good choice. <laughs> Mom, I love him anyway. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> love, love is blind, right? You ever hear the, the, the saying, love is blind, but marriage takes away the blinders? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> so, uh, we have the historical books. Then we have what are called the prophetic books. And that means we got the prophets. Now, understand the prophets, you have what is called the major prophets and the minor prophets like uh, Major League, Minor League Baseball. Okay. <laughs> so you've got the Major Prophets and the Minor Prophets. Can we give you the easiest way to make the differentiation? You know the differentiation between the two? It's, it's, it's very simple. Right. The Major Prophets have, have more chapters in them. <laughs> <laughs> is that hard to remember? Is no, it? that's easy. <laughs> so the, the, major prophet, the Major Prophets have they're big. Um, and the, there are four of them. And they would be Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel. Okay? Yes. Isaiah has more than 60 chapters. I call Isaiah the Shakespeare of the Bible. Yes. Isaiah, if you, if you read through it, we read through it in, in Advent as well as... Um, as well as in uh, Lent. And about three, about three months ago, we went through some of the parts of Isaiah. We were going through all the prophets and the, the readings in ordinary time. Uh, so you have, uh, those are the major prophets, then you have the minor prophets. One of the major, can you, can you uh, mention a minor prophet? Habakkuk. <laughs> <laughs> Zephaniah, Nahum, Amos, okay? These are, they're not as well known often as the major prophets, but every, every prophet is the word of God. Yes. Every chapter is the word of God. All right, from there we move to what is called the, the wisdom literature. Okay, the wisdom literature. 
The wisdom literature, much is attributed to King Solomon, who was the wisest man in the world. But you know, he ended up as the biggest fool. Yes, he did. Because he gave in to lust. Every time I think about him, it keeps me humble. Because we're here today. You believe in God, you believe in God. Our family, Perseverance family, believe in God. Will we believe in God five years from today? Or ten years from today? Or even a year from today? How many of you have children that were strong and then they went to college and they started to doubt their faith, they became even agnostics? Or atheists? Do you ever talk with the atheist who says, I'm an atheist, thanks be to God? <laughs> <laughs> My dad used to say he was in the Second World War, there are no atheists in foxholes. You hear that? Yes, one? yes. Under pressure. We, we opened up our eyes and we called out to God, God help me, right? Yes. Okay, can we name some of the wisdom books? Look, okay, one is wisdom. Song of, Song of Songs. Song of Songs. Wisdom, Proverbs, Syrac, Ecclesiastes, okay? Even Job is considered a literary genre mm, okay. of the wisdom books. Okay. And what they transmit uh, to us is wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> and the Psalms are also, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the Psalms are considered part of the, the category of the wisdom literature. So there you have, there you have the, the five basic uh, literary uh, blocks of information in the Old Testament. The Pentateuch, then you've got the historical books, then you've got the major prophets and minor prophets, and then finally you've got the wisdom books, or four categories, the wisdom books. That's the Old Testament. Now the Old Testament <coughs> is the Word of God. But so is the New Testament. And the New Testament has about half the number of books. So from 46 to 27 books. One little biblical note. This is, uh, this is the Holy Bible. And uh, <coughs> this Holy Bible, the Dewey Rames Version, is uh, this probably won't shock you, but this this is a Catholic Bible. <laughs> Thank heaven. Did I shock you? <laughs> Tan Publisher is a good publisher. Hmm? Yes. And um, in small, I don't know if you could uh, just lift this up, Mary. Small print is an imprimatur. If you maybe draw it close to the. Small letters, but it says imprimatur. Thank you, Mary. I, 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 I've said that because probably has happened to some of you on some anniversary or birthday, someone gave you a Bible, and you open up the Bible and there was not the imprimatur. What does that mean? It's not, gonna, not a Catholic Bible. Protestant Bible. Protestant Bible. Protestant yeah. Bible. Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, it's interesting that many different religions have a Bible. The Jewish people have a Bible, but just of the Old Testament. Then the Orthodox have a Bible. The Protestants have a Bible. Do you know how many books the Protestant Bible is? It's 66. Why? Because in the time of Martin Luther, this was the Protestant Reformation, he, they discarded uh, six, six of those books. They're called the, the apocryphal books. They don't have Maccabees 1, mm -hmm. or Maccabees 2, two or Judith, or Esther, or, or Tobit. They've eliminated these books. So how do we know that this is called the canon of the Bible? The reason why is because the Pope called the council back in the uh, 16th century, in the 1500s, when St. Ignatius was living, yes. and St. Charles Borromeo was living, and yes. Pius V, Philip Neri, and those great saints, they called the Council, it's called the Council of Trent. And among the many things that they did, 
was they published the Universal Catechism of the, Cas of the Council of Trent. But also, they determine what are the inspired books of the Bible. So you have the canon, not the canon that used at war, but the canon <laughs> means the, the law or the mm -hmm. rule would be the number of books in the Bible that are inspired. So all of us should have, all of us should have a, uh, a Catholic Bible. Yes. You might even ask me, well, what's a good translation? Okay, that's a good question. Thank you for asking <laughs> me that question. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, we have a lot. We, we have a lot of our followers that are Hispanic. The America Latina is terrible. It's a very bad translation. I would say if you do speak Spanish, the Pueblo de Dios translated in Argentina that they had for many years, very good. The Navarre Bible, and then the Jerusalem Bible. So here in LA, most people have the America Latina, but the translation is pretty. It's pretty weak. No? For example, Luke chapter 18, when the assistant widow, it, it, the judge says, um, if I don't give in, me va, romper la, uh, me va romper la cabeza. How do you translate that? You're going to break my, break my head. How they're translated in English? You're going to be doing me, doing me violence. Isn't there a difference there? It's just yes. one. The Italians say, tradore tradire. To translate is to is to betray. So uh, I not that I'm I want to be overly persnickety on this, but I think it's good to have a good translation. Yes. Because you're gonna have the Bible your whole life. Might as well get. It's like buying a car with three wheels or four wheels. I prefer with four wheels. I mean, <laughs> yes. Driving the freeway with three wheels yes. is probably not gonna arrive as fast, no? Yes. We have the police after you also. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so translations, the, the, the Jerusalem Bible is, is probably the best from the French school. Yes. Then you have the um, Navarre Bible, which is very good. You have also the Ignatius Bible, a very good translation. Yes. Then you have the Navarre translation. Yes. The ones that we give to our confirmation students, the red one. Yes. Uh, the New American Bible, yes. it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So those are various translations of the Bible. Make sure you get a Bible, make sure you get a Catholic Bible. Okay? So, from there, let's move into the New Testament. Both Old Testament and New Testament are the inspired Word of God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has one number where it just mentions the Gospels. It's about the shortest number you have. And it mentions the four Gospels. Can you mention them? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Got it. Perfect. <laughs> A plus. Thank you. The word Gospel in the Spanish and Greek is Evangelium, Evangelio. You know what it means? It means good news. Mm -hmm. So there are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know they're called the synoptics because of the sameness of the message? You're going to get more or less the same topics. Whereas John is different. Yes. According to tradition, the first one that came up was most likely Mark. Matthew is directed to the Jews. Yes. And you see a lot of biblical references to the Old Testament. Mark to the Romans. Luke to the Greeks and to the whole world. What about John? John was written especially to the early Christians. And John is very different because that's written about the year 100. According to tradition, St. John lived to be older than 100 years of age. Wow. Yeah, the others died as martyrs. They tried to kill him more than once, but, God, but the Lord saved him. So the Gospel of John has many uh, passages that the others don't have. I mentioned a couple? Yes. The prologue. In the beginning was the Word, the Word yes. was with God. That's only in John. Yes. Then you've got uh, the wedding feast of Cain is only in John. Yes. 
And then the discord, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. That's only in John. Then you have the woman at the well. Yes. Woman, give me the drink. That's only in John. How about the bread of life discourse? Are you going to find that in Matthew? How about Mark? How about Luke? Only in John. How about how, how, how about the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead? Only in John. So John is, is in a category by, set by itself. And the symbol of John is actually an eagle because he's known to be the mystic. He flies high. Yes. He soars. He's the, yes, he's the mystic. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, a little trivia now. Do you know how many chapters in each one <coughs> of, these, of these Gospels? I do not. Okay, how many? Wrong. Mark 17. Wrong. Luke 24. Yes. One out of three. <laughs> John 21. Oh, uh, two. That's about 500. <laughs> no, pretty good. <laughs> okay. So Matthew, there's 28. Mark is 16, which is the shortest. Luke is 24. And John is 21. That's worthy of memorizing, right? Sure. Homework today. That's my homework. Those. That's my homework. <laughs> Good. Okay, then, after, after the Gospels, we have what is called the Acts of the Apostles. Yes. And the Acts of the Apostles is not A-X-E, but A-C-T-A. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have an axe to grind, no? They did not. <laughs> and you know who wrote that? It was St. Luke. Yes. So St. Luke wrote the third gospel and actually wrote the Acts too. And that goes through, it goes through what happened to the church at the very beginning. I think one of the best ways to, to image that is when you're going into the Basilica of St. Peter's, you have these two majestic statues, one with a sword, another one with a big key. The sword is St. Paul. The key is St. Peter. The sword, why? Because St. Paul says that the word of God is like a two-edged sword that separates bar marrow from bone. And also he was decapitated by the sword. Yes. And Peter has a key. Because Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declared bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you declared loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the Acts of Apostles, you're going to have the first part you encounter basically a lot of St. Peter. You got the Ascension, you got the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. You have Peter getting up and giving the Pentecost discourse. You had Peter going to the temple with John, raising the man that was paralytic. Okay, And then the last two thirds, Peter recedes in the background and you got the conversion of Saul who becomes Paul and you have him prominent until the, uh, the last chapter of the 20th. Yes, yes. So the, the Acts of the Apostles, you don't, you don't have all the Apostles, but especially those two. Mm -hmm. and you know it's also known to be the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You really want to get to know the Holy Spirit. You can read books written by saints or scholars, but I think the best is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Apostles. Yes, I agree. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. It's a very, very, very... Um, it's a book where there's a lot of action, too. Yes, there is. There's persecution, they're thrown in jail, they're whipped, they're doing this or that. There's Paul the shipwreck. There's a lot of action, no? Yes, and there is. If you fall asleep during that, that's your fault, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay, then after, after the Acts of the Apostles... We have the letters of the Apostle St. Paul. Fourteen letters of the Apostle St. Paul. Can you name a few, Mary? Some of the letters of the Apostle St. Paul? No, Father. 
Romans, then you oh, have one Corinthians, two Corinthians, and you got you got Ephesians, you got Galatians, you got yeah. you wrote a letter to the theologians, was it? Oh, Thessalonians, <laughs> no, to the to the Filipinos. <laughs> Philippians. No, the Philippians. Okay, Philippians <laughs> to Colossians, right? Yes. So these are the letters that St. Paul wrote to um, various communities. So what is the origin of this? Well, St. Paul was a great missionary, that we know. And he would go and he would found communities. For example, the community at Corinth. And then he would he would ordain presbyters, which means the priests. Yes. And sometimes even bishops. Yes. Like Timothy and Titus. Then he'd leave. And he'd go from one place to other, and he'd, he'd be establishing churches and communities. So news was brought to him what was going on in the communities. And he, and he wrote letters addressing these problems. For example, in Corinth, uh, there's a, he hears of a serious problem in which a, a man is living with his father's wife, which would be his, his stepmother. Pretty bad, huh? Pretty bad. <laughs> what a scandal. So St. Paul writes a letter and says, hey, you've got you to purge that. It's not a very good example of the community, is it? No. Yes. You have yes. to move, move on that right away, no? Yes. So he addresses those local problems. Yes. And so that these problems can be resolved to help the community keep growing. Yes. All right. Those are called the letters of St. Paul. Then there are what are called the Catholic letters. The Catholic letters, Catholic means universal, Yes. written to the whole world. And what are some of these Catholic letters? Okay, the, le the letter of St. Paul to, rather the, the three letters of St. John, then you have the letter of St. James, then you have the letter of Jude, then you have the letter of St. Peter, they're actually two short letters. These are Catholic letters which are written to the whole world. Okay. Then you have a very interesting book, it's called The Letter of the Hebrews, which has very strong priestly overtones. And to understand that, we have to understand the Old Testament. Now to understand the New Testament well, it's also important that we understand the Old Testament. Because a lot of the images of the Old Testament become a reality in the New Testament. It's called biblical typology. Yes. What would be a, a biblical type of the Old Testament that becomes a reality in the New Testament? The manna becomes okay. the Eucharist. There you have it. Okay. So the manna in the Old Testament we encounter the Jewish people traveling through the desert, Moses gives them, God gives them manna through Moses. Jesus gets up and says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I'll raise him up on the last day. So, many of these figures or types of the Old Testament, they become a reality in the New Testament. Yes. They're figures, they're symbols, they're types. It's called biblical typology. Yes. Then the last book of the Bible <coughs> is the book of Revelation. Of Revelation. Or Apocalypse. Okay. Why do why do we say it in two different ways? I don't know, and I'd like to know that. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, Revelation would be the Latin, and Apocalypse would be the Greek. Okay. Glad you brought that up because. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't mention this earlier. The language of the Bible. So the Bible was first written in English? No, Father, in Greek, right? Okay, the original Bible, uh, the Old Testament was written in, in, uh, in Hebrew. 
Yes. Aramaic. Yes. For example, Mo Moses. Right. And the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek. Right. Yeah. Who was the one that God chose to do the monolithic task of translating the Bible from the Greek and Aramaic into the Latin. It's called the it's called the Vulgate, and then eventually from the Vulgate into the vernacular. Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome. Yes. Do you remember that famous phrase of Saint Jerome that we actually have in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the dogmatic constitution called De Verbum? It's probably one of the most famous passages quoted. In honor of Saint Jerome. Is that ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ? You got it. Yeah. So ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. So he spent many, many years working on the translation of the Bible from the Aramaic into Latin, the Greek into Latin. And then from that it was translated into the into the languages that we speak, the vernacular. Yes. So we, we, we owe a, a huge uh, thanksgiving to St. Jerome for doing that. Otherwise, we, we'd have to be reading the Bible in, in, in Greek and Aramaic. How's your Greek and Aramaic? <laughs> it's probably pretty poor. Non-existent. Non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> Worse, lower than poor. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, the poor only, would be an improvement. <laughs> the only, no, only words you know in, in, um, in Aramaic would be Hosanna, Amen, Alleluia, right? Oh, okay, yes, <laughs> I know three. <laughs> you know Greek? Kyrie you oh, know yes. a little bit of Greek, yes, okay? Yes, I do. So it's, it's Greek to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, there, there's, a, there's an overview of, um, uh, of the Bible, and um, just that we round out our discussion, in our Perseverance class, we are meditating upon the Bible, which is the Word of God. We, on Sunday we have three readings, and uh, on the weekdays, unless it's uh, solemnity, we have two readings in the psalm. Mary, do you think that uh, in the context of a Mass, when we were celebrating the Mass in the, in the church before the pandemic, like a Sunday Mass, we have quite a called the Book of the Gospels. Does the uh, does the priest and if there's a deacon show reverence to the Bible? Well, they do. One one is usually um, on the in the entrance procession. They 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 hold the Bible up. They it Perfect. walks in front of the priest. Exactly. Yeah. So say for example, okay, if it if it's a deacon. You know, the deacon has the first degree of holy orders. You've got diaconate, presbyter, and episcopacy. So if the deacon is carrying... I remember when, uh, when uh, as a child, we, um, we had a priest that would come to visit us, Father Henriksen. He was, uh, he was the, the priest at Our Lady Mount Carmel in New Jersey. And I think he gave me a Bible, or he's talking the Bible, and he said, never c carry the Bible like this. Because when we went to school back back in those days, we'd carry our books uh, yes. to school. No, and, <laughs> under our arm, <laughs> yes. We'd yes, have a knapsack. Yes. We'd carry the books, and yes. you arrived at school, and your arm was kind of tired because you. I, I had to walk about two miles to school. No? Yes, yes. But he never said never carry it like this. Yes. Why? Because that's not uh, that's not showing reverence to the. That's body. right. She never put like a. Like a, a beer mug on top of the Bible, should you marry? Yeah? <laughs> no, or a coffee cup. Or a coffee cup. Get a coffee stain. <laughs> <laughs> right. Adrian Rogers says this, he who has a Bible falling apart will probably not have his life falling apart. That's hmm? a good one. Father Benedict Rochelle tells this story. He said there was a Protestant lady talking with a Catholic lady. And they're talking about um, what, they did, what they would do in their... Sunday uh, ceremonies. We call it the Mass. They would call their their celebration. And the Protestant lady said this, oh, our pastor, what he does is he, he reads the Bible, 
He teaches the Bible. He preaches the Bible. He gets us to memorize the Bible. We sing biblical songs. We got the Bible. And then the Protestants ask the Catholic, well, what do you do in your celebration? And the Catholic said, well, we read the bulletin. Oh. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> it's uh, I heard that from Father Benny Groeschel. That's a but good it's, one. It's uh, it's there's some truth in that. Yes, but there's sadness in it. There's sadness a lot. There's nothing wrong with the bulletin because often my articles are put in the bulletin. <laughs> okay, so let's give some credit to the bulletin, yes, right, Mary? Yes. <laughs> And, uh, okay, l l let's go through the, the reverence that we should have for the Word of God in, in the Sunday Mass. So there's a procession. Yes. You have the altar servers carrying the candles, right? Yes. You have someone, an altar server with the, with the thurible, yes. with the incense, yes. with the incense pot. Hmm? Yes. And then the priest is carrying it. He's not carrying it underneath his arm, is he? No, he's not, Father. He is elevating it on high. Yes, yes. Walking slowly in procession. Yes. Now, to understand a lot of our Catholic faith, we have to understand basic symbols. If he were to come walking in underneath his arm, sauntering in, no? it's kind of like a flippant, shoddy, nonchalant, Irreverent at it, wouldn't you agree? Yes. But if he's raising it on high, preceded by the incense and the candles and the altar servers uh, decked up in their best. Yes. Okay? Yes. Like, like this. That yes. actually says to the people. Yes. Look how important the Word of God is. Yes. You know? You, even without saying any words. Look how important the Word of God is, how high yes. this is elevated. Yes. Now, when he arrives, does he put it on, on, underneath the lectern? No, Father. <laughs> underneath the lectern, so no, kind Father. of hidden away? No, Father. Where does he place it, Mary? On the lectern. No, no he actually puts it on the altar. On the altar first? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The fact, the fact that he places it on the altar, that says a lot. Yes, yes it is. Because the altar symbolizes the body of Christ. Yes. Right? Yes. Because then that altar is going to descend from heaven. The body and the blood of Christ. Yes. So it's there the Bible and then it's not going to be there during the consecration. Right. But before the consecration, the word of God is resting on the altar. That's beautiful. I don't think I've noticed that. Yes. Yeah. That's why Vatican II says that we nourish ourselves every mm. Sunday Mass. We nourish ourselves from two tables, the table of the Word of God and the table of the body and blood of Christ. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. The table beautiful. of the Word of God and the table of the body and blood of Christ. Yes. So, let, let's move on with other gestures of reverence. Now, before the priest or deacon proclaims the gospel, did you ever, are you observing, do you ever notice what happens in the liturgical gestures that happen before he's going to be proclaiming the Word of God? Well, I, um, I know, now I realize when I said the lectern that was wrong, because even I see in Mass yes. that they, they carry the Bible, again, elevated right. in their arms, and they carry in their hands, and they and carry who's, it who's, the who's at the right and the left? The, the right and left of the altar servers with candles. Yes. So again, they're following the, 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 sacred, the sacred book. Yeah, it makes it sacred. Yes. Yeah. And then it's placed on the, on the lectern. Yes. Now, there's about various gestures, and if we pay attention... We really see the relevance that the church gives for the Word of God, how, how it respects it. It's placed on the lectern, and then the priest says, The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And what do we do? We talked make, about this earlier, didn't we? We make, we make the sign of the cross on, on our, our forehead, forehead, on our, our lips, lips, and over our heart. And over our heart. 
Yes. And that means we want the Word of God to be in our mind. We want the Word of God to be in our lips. We want the Word of God to be in our heart, right? Yes. We want it to be in our mind. Yes. It's a lamp for us. Yes. It's a light. It's a lantern, as the psalm points out. Yes. But we don't want it simply to be upstairs. We want to be able to express the Word of God. Yes. Preach the Word of God, evangelize, to catechize. Yes. That's very important. But if it's only in the head and the lips, you know, we're, 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 we're a hypocrite, right? That's true. Because it's, if it's not going from the head to the lips to the heart, it's incomplete. That's true. Pope Francis says it has to go also to the feet. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Very, very, like well, that? very well said. Very well so said. So it's got to be in the head. It's got to be in the lips. It's got to be in the heart. It's got to be in the feet. Yes. Uh, so the, the priest says the, God, the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John, Glory to you, Lord. Do you know what happens in the solemn mass? Maybe you don't remember, but I'll tell you if you don't. I don't remember, so if you tell Is me. that the altar server gives them the thurible, which is the incense pot? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. And click, 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 click. Yes. Click, click. Yes. So he's incensing the, the, the book of the Gospels. And the white smoke is ascending on high. Yes couple of interpretations of that. It's ascending on high because the Word of God wants to be transformed into prayer. In other words, you're meditating upon the Word of God on a daily basis. You'll be meditating upon Ephesians and Jesus heals this woman who's stooped over, paralytic basically for 18 years, and Jesus expels the bad spirit in the synagogue. That's your, your reading for today. You want, you want the Word of God to be, be turned into reflection, meditation, and prayer. But also, I love a lot of incense. Yes. I love a lot of incense, no? I Some do of the too. other priests, they've got allergies, and they just want, just a very, um, a very limited. But I, there's no, you, you, I've never had too much incense. Yes. And after I go in the sacrifice, I smell like incense. That's right. Right. And St. Paul says we're called to be the fragrance of Christ. Mm, beautiful. Now, beautiful. the fragrance of Christ means we're called to be redolent. We're yes. called to, to transmit the fragrance of Christ, which means a holy life. Yes. A holy life. Yes. And is there anything else done to the book of the Gospels after the priest finishes proclaiming it. It's a small gesture, but it's important. I don't remember. He actually kisses it. Oh, that's right. Yes, he does. He kisses the yes. gospel. Yes, he does. And a kiss is symbolic of love. Yes. So all, the, you, all those gestures give relevance to the importance and reverence that the Catholic Church gives to the Word of God. Yes. Carrying it on high in procession. Yes. Placing it on the altar. Yes. Procession, once again, from the altar to the pulpit. Yes. Surrounded by two altar servers with their candles that they have lighted during the reading. Yes. Then the proclamation, and the people bless their foreheads, they bless their lips, and they bless their heart. They don't bless their feet, though. <laughs> <laughs> so the word of the word of God should be in our minds. Yes. It should be in our lips. Yes. It should be in our heart. Yes. It should move our feet. Yes. Yes. And then the incense of the uh, of the gospel. Yes. And the white smoke ascending on high. Symbolic of our prayers ascending to heaven. That the word of God has to be transformed into prayer. And then we're called to put it into practice. Yes. So the church shows great reverence to the word of God. And as I said earlier, quoting uh, Vatican II, this is taken from De Verbum. Yes. What De Verbum is, De Verbum is the dogmatic, Constitution and revelation and the Word of God. Yes. And highlights the importance 
of us loving the Word of God. Quoting St. Jerome that you quoted earlier. Yes. Ignorance of sacred scripture is ignorance of Christ. Yes. But I like the image that I mentioned earlier. Is every time we go to Mass on Sunday, or even a weekday Mass, we're called to nourish ourselves. Nourish ourselves from two different tables. The first table is the Word of God. The second table is the bread of life. Yes. Remember when I was studying in Rome, Father Jordan Alman, uh, who wrote the book on spiritual theology, was my teacher when I was a deacon, my fourth year of theology when I was studying spiritual theology. And I remember he gave a really good image to differentiate between the Catholic celebration, which is the Mass, and a Protestant celebration. Mm -hmm. And he said this, the Protestants have as the very center of their celebration, the pulpit. Yes, they do. So they have the preaching of the Word of God. Right. And then most of the weeks, after the preaching of the Word of God and singing the Word of God, it's over. Yes. Whereas the Catholic Church has two tables. Yes, we do. We have the we have the word we have the pulpit. Yes. Sunday mass, you got the first reading, you got the responsorial psalm, you got the second reading, usually taken from Saint Paul. Yes. You got the gospel reading, then you got the homily. So you have a very rich menu, don't we? No? Yes. Very rich menu. But that's not the that, that's not the only table. The table of the Word of God should lead us to the table of the body and blood of Christ. Yes. So the more that we are allowed the Word of God to, to assimilate the Word of God, to let, to let it enter, as I said in, in uh, the spiritual lectures, and to enter through osmosis, to assimilate it, yes. then the more fruitful will be our communions. Right. So the fruitfulness or efficaciousness, the dispositive grace of communion depends a lot upon uh, how we receive the Word of God. Because we have to know Christ to receive Him, to receive, know who we're receiving and receive exactly. Him fully. The last point I'd like to make, Mary, is this. And uh, I, I purposely spent the whole hour on this because we are, in our Perseverance family, we're, we're delving into the Word of God, unless we have an overall view and I've gone through in one hour what I've been skipping over the past couple of weeks in the Catechism because we've gone through the different numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on, on the Bible. So I've given a good hour uh, presentation on that. But let's end with Mary. Yes. Mary. Mary, we have two times in the Gospel where it says that Mary, for her part, she pondered the Word of God in her heart. Two times. Yes. And that's in uh, the second chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. Yes. And that was when the shepherds came to visit Mary with the child Jesus. Yes. They came and they visited. After they left, Mary, for her part, she pondered this happening. Right. In her heart. Yes. Twelve years later, when Jesus is lost in the temple, finally they find him after three days of sorrowful search. And then after they find him, Mary, for her, for her part, she meditated, she pondered this mystery in her heart. Yes. So we have to say that the Blessed Virgin Mary, is a, she's a real model for us. Uh, she can help us to go deeper, deeper into the Word of God. So, uh, my friends and Jesus and Mary, that I've given you a summary of about uh, probably a good 15 numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it explains the importance of the Word of God. And as we've already said two times, we'll say it again, and I'd like to give uh, a special blessing today. Yes. St. Jerome's words. We should all have this memorized. St. Jerome, who translated the Bible from Aramaic 
and Greek into Latin and from the Latin into English and Spanish. He says, ignorance of sacred scripture is ignorance of Christ. And we pray the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. That bread is the Word of God. Yes. So hopefully we delve deeper and deeper into the riches of the Word of God as we're faithful to our daily holy hour. Yes. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession of Mary most holy and God's angels and saints, may God bless you in a very special way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.